well, it's been a hell of a week. It's been really, really busy. Um, so I'm just squeezing in a quick video at the end of the week, and I thought we'd talk about the year. I've been thinking about doing some videos about the year for a while, because we did the eye, and then uh, one of uh, you lot commented that could I do the middle ear, so I thought, okay, fine, yeah, we'll do it. And what we need to do is with the ear, there are lots of different parts. I know a little bit about the ear. So we can break this up into a series of videos. We've got the external ear, we've got the middle ear, we've got the cochlea, we've got the um, semicircular canals, the vestibular apparatus and so on. So we'll chunk this up. So the bit we'll do in this video is basically this little bit here, the tympanic cavity or the middle ear. What we've got in here is that here's a tube opening externally, which is the external acoustic meatus, and here's the tympanic membrane. So we've got this tube and it ends at the membrane. And then here's another tube here. Uh, this is the pharyngeotympanic tube, used to be called the eustachian tube, also gets called the um, auditory tube. And this tube opens up inside the nasal cavity, inside the nasopharynx back here, right? In there. Um, so then we have this air space essentially in here. And in there, we have the tympanic membrane, which vibrates. We have uh, the ossicles, the bones that uh, transmit those vibrations to the cochlea in here. Um, and a couple of muscles and a few other bits and bobs. So it's an air-filled chamber. Um, it also connects to, this is the mastoid process here. I have another video about the air cells of the mastoid process and how an ear infection can travel into there. So I've covered this before, but this space then is continuous with the air cells um, of the mastoid process. Um, but this bit here, where are we then? So if I put this back on top, you see this, this ridge of bone here? This ridge of bone is, oh, this is a nice clean skull. If we look inside, uh, there's the external acoustic meatus there, and in here, this is the, the temporal bone here, and there's a rocky ridge, a petrous ridge, and inside that petrous part of the, of the temporal bone, that's where we find the semicircular canals and the cochlea, but also that's where we're finding the middle ear, also known as the tympanic cavity, in that bony space. So how much of this can I dissect? Um, so through this space, we've obviously got the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is going to innovate these guys, the vestibular stuff and the cochlear stuff. But also running through here, we have branches of the facial nerve, uh, corda tympani runs through here, we have the uh, tympanic plexus, we've also got branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve. We've got various nerves running through this space working their way through the bony bits of the skull to get out. Um, the bits of most interest then, so the tympanic membrane um, separates off the outside air from the air within the tympanic cavity, within the, within the middle ear. So while this is a very large ear model, the tympanic membrane in life is it's kind of oval shaped. It's about, what, a centimetre? in diameter along its uh, largest, longest axis. Um, it's somewhat translucent. It's um, curved, so it's concave this way. So there's, there's a depression on this surface. Um, it has a bit of shape to it. You can see the handle of the malleus bone on the opposite side, which we'll look at in a little while. Um, and the the external surface, or the more superficial surface, is covered in thin skin, whereas the, the deeper surface is covered in a mucous membrane. Um, the reason I, I thought about doing this is because I was talking about the embryology of the pharyngeal arches today. The pharyngeal arches are embryological structures that give rise to the bits of the face and the head and the neck. And 
um, the ear is a cool, it, the ear is between the first and second arches, so we get some cool overlaps in anatomy. Um, so I was, which is why I was thinking about the ear earlier, and particularly thinking about the middle ear. Um, but my point is that the, so the superficial surface, the sensory innervation of that runs through the nerve of the first arch, which is the trigeminal nerve. Um, there are branches of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve carrying sensory innervation from that side, where we have branches from the glossopharyngeal nerve, the nerve of the third arch, funnily enough, um, carrying sensory innervation from the other side. A little bit too much, yeah, I know, sorry, but a bit of embryological interest. Now, of, of typical interest to most people is popping your ears. So if this is the pharyngeotypanic tube and it's partially bone and partially cartilage, and you can see the bony bit here, and you can see the cartilage bit here. Now the cartilage bit is quite soft. This is lined by a mucous membrane, so normally at rest, these two surfaces are pretty much sticking to one another, which means that the air in here is, is kind of closed off. Um, and there is an opening, as I said, in the nasopharynx here, now that opening is, see we are, right? Nasal cavity, there's the nasal cavity, there's the nasopharynx. That is the opening of the pharyngeotympanic tube there. So, theoretically, you can allow air to pass in through that hole and get into the tympanic cavity, the middle ear that would also be a route of infection. So if you've got an upper respiratory tract infection, it's possible that infection could pass along here and get into this lovely space for the virus or bacteria to, uh, to live in. They'd be quite happy in there, and that would be an ear infection. Um, but, of course, oh, when you get in a plane, and you take off and the cabin pressure changes, you can feel that pressure change in your ear, can't you? When you're driving up and down mountains and hills, you feel that pressure change as well. And what you're feeling is the difference in pressure between the tympanic cavity there, the difference in air pressure in here, to the air pressure out there. And of course what it's doing is it's deflecting, it's pushing or pulling on the tympanic membrane. So that's what you're feeling. So what do you do to get rid of that um, I just did it then. What do you do to get rid of that sensation? Well, you, you swallow, you pop your ears. So how does that help? Well, the opening here in the nasopharynx is surrounded by muscles of the soft palate, uh, tensor veli palatini and levator veli palatini. They both attach in here. So when you swallow, you elevate your soft palate and you pull it to separate the nasopharynx off from the oropharynx. And, and when those muscles contract, they also pull on the opening of the pharyngeotympanic tube here and they open it up, allowing air to either pass in or out, do whatever it needs to do so that the pressure in here equalizes with the pressure out here and indeed the pressure in your nasal cavity because the air pressure here is gonna be the same as the air pressure there, right? So when you swallow, and you open it and the air pressure equalizes, that sensation of a pressure difference, that sensation in your ears disappears, doesn't it? That's why. Another interesting thing about this tube and all these spaces here is that um, if you're a parent like me, you're probably well aware how uh, children have far more ear infections than adults. Um, so that's an ear infection in here and it can affect the tympanic membrane. It's very, very painful um, because this is a very sensitive area. Now the reason is, is that because um, the skull changes shape as you grow, right? Um, one of the things, so one of the things we see is that in children, the pharyngeotympanic tube is shorter and more horizontal than it is in adults. You can see in this ear how the pharyngeotympanic tube has a fair old slant to it. So that that this, this slant, this angle, and the length of the pharyngeotympanic tube means it's less likely in adults to get an ear infection all the way up here. Still possible, but in kids it's much shorter and more horizontal, which means it's easier for, for infections to track in here. So children have far more ear infections than adults because of this anatomy. Um, also probably because kids' immune systems haven't developed as much as ours. They haven't seen as many cold viruses as us, right? So they get more upper respiratory tract infections anyway and then they try and pass them on to us. <laughs> of course, the purpose of the tympanic membrane is to detect 
vibrations in the air, pressure waves, right? So the tympanic membrane vibrates as the air vibrates. Um, and what we need to do is we need to transfer those vibrations from the tympanic membrane, which is quite large, it's filling this, this tube space. And we've got to transfer that to the cochlea somehow. And in the cochlea, we've got hair cells in a fluid that bend, so, and then nerves attached to those, so they can detect the flexing of hair cells and then we perceive sound. We'll do that another time. Now, what we've got in here is, Okay. Ooh. So, there's the tympanic membrane, that's the um, outside surface, so we've got this concavity. So if you were to look in the ear canal you'd see a lot of earwax, uh, ceruminous wax, but you also see the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, it's somewhat translucent, and can you see this line down the middle here? This gets called the umbo. What we're really looking at there is the first bone. So we have three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the first one is the malleus. So malleus is the hammer. Something's malleable, right? Uh, and the malleus hits the anvil. Can you see this anvil shaped? Got to use your imagination a little bit. The anvil. Anyway, so what malleus does is, you can see how it's attached to the, the tympanic membrane. So as the tympanic membrane vibrates, malleus is going to vibrate as well, right? Um, and these are the smallest bones in the body. So the tympanic membrane is vibrating, malleus is going to vibrate, malleus is articulating with incus, the second bone of the three ossicles of the ear, and um, we have um, a muscle called uh, tensor tympani, which we can actually see on the model. Tensor tympani attaches to, I can see the attachment point there, uh, attaches to malleus and the job of tensor tympani is to dampen very loud sounds. It's part of a reflex. Um, the reflex um, takes about I think 40 or 50 milliseconds, something like that, um, to activate, which means that loud shouting sounds, um, thunder, you know, loud trains, so loud noises of a sufficient duration can be dampened by tensor tympani contracting and pulling on malleus to dampen its vibrations. But something really fast, like a gunshot, or a really fast explosion, something unexpected, isn't going to be dampened by tympa uh, tensor tympani. So malleus um, articulates with incus. Incus is the anvil, um, so this vibrates as well. And then incus will vibrate with stapes. This is tensor tympani here. So if you think about it, it's actually a pretty big muscle given the size of the bone that squidges in there. That's tensor tympani running across here. But malleus and incus there we go, articulate with stapes. Um, but by now, stapes is pretty deep in here. But stapes looks like a stirrup. I'm sure you've seen stapes. I thought I could get away with just using one model, but nope. <laughs> See, oh look, that's funny. That's a that's a right ear. This is a left ear model. Never noticed that before. So um, this model is a little bit smaller and simpler, but it shows the ossicles quite nicely. And we can see in here we can see there, that is the stapes bone. So it's very much shaped like a stirrup and the vibrations of malleus and incus will then be transferred to stapes and stapes will vibrate and stapes has a foot, has a, an oval base and that oval base um, articulates with the oval window of the cochlea. Um, now, each of these 
ossicles, the bones have got a whole bunch of features on them and maybe we'll look at them in more detail in a more detailed video. But that's the important idea is malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane and vibrates. It translates those vibrations to incus, which tr translates those vibrations to stapes, which translates those vibrations to the oval window. Now the oval window, uh, those vibrations are transmitted to the oval window, there's fluid within the cochlea, so that creates pressure waves within the cochlea, and then the sensitive apparatus within the cochlea can detect those pressure waves and we can perceive sound, so the, the vibrations in the air become sound thanks to our brain. Um, but because we're going from a fairly large tympanic membrane to a much smaller uh, base of the stapes in the oval window, that means that the force of vibration increases. And I think it increases something like tenfold. Now, stapes here has got a hole in it. That's why it gets called the stirrup, is because it looks like a, you know, a stirrup on a horse, right? Um, stapes has a hole in it because of the stapedial artery. But this is just an embryonic thing. So, um, again, if you look at the pharyngeal arteries and what have you in the aortic arteries, uh, the stapedial artery in the embryo um, is a link between a few other arteries and helps in development of branches of the maxillary artery and in middle meningeal artery and stuff like that. But the stapedial artery disappears in the fetus probably as early as around uh, week 10, something like that, um, and leaving this hole here. Um, if the stapedial artery doesn't disappear and the baby is born with a stapedial artery and the adult has a stapedial artery, this gets called a persistent stapedial artery, and if you have a persistent stapedial artery, because it's kind of bunging up this hole and affecting all of these vibrations, it will have an effect on the, on the hearing. Um, it, can, it can have all sorts of different effects depending upon what state it's in and where it is and that sort of thing. But persistent stapedial artery, well, is because of the development of this stuff. Okay, um, another fun pub quiz fact is if the ossicles are the smallest bones in the body and stapes is the smallest of the ossicles, stapes is the smallest bone in the body, um, but also it has a muscle associated with it, it has the stapedius muscle. This is grossly enlarged, right? Um, the stapedius muscle, which I doubt is on any of these models, the stapedius muscle is about a millimetre long, maybe a little bit longer. It's a tiny, tiny muscle. Um, and what stapedius, the stapedius muscle does is it then dampens the vibrations. Well, it doesn't so much dampen the vibrations of stapes as much as kind of pulls it into place and more importantly, limits its movement. So it doesn't move too much, right? So it limits the movements. The stapedius muscle limits the movements of stapes. Um, the nerve to stapedius is called the nerve to stapedius, simple, and it's a branch of the facial nerve. I said cranial nerve 7 is wandering through here, so the nerve to stapedius is a branch of the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. Um, and then if the nerve to stapedius is damaged, for example if you have a Bell's palsy or some sort of um, pathology of the facial nerve and the stapedius muscle isn't working, then normal volume sounds might sound really loud because stapes is allowed to move much more than it should, right? So the amplitude increases. So stapes transfers the vibrations from the um, tympanic membrane to the oval window and then things happen inside the cochlea and that we shall save for another day. All right, we'll do another day looking at the different bits. You know how long I talk for, if I keep I'm going for hours. Anyway, okay, so that's a start on the ear. We've got a lot of ear structures to look at, but that's a start. That's the middle ear, also known as the tympanic cavity. Uh, remember I, I did that mastoid air cells ear infection video, so go and have a look at that one. Um, maybe some of the skull videos. If you want some refreshes of the other structures around here. Okay, right, um, depending on how much time I have next week, I'll, um, I'll do either a simple bit of the ear or a complex bit of the ear. See you next week, maybe?